manager of the HSE's National Safeguarding Office. Um, you're all very welcome this morning. This is a webinar on safeguarding and restrictive practice within intellectual disability services. Um, I'm delighted that the HSE's National Safeguarding Office uh, have had this opportunity to run the seminar this morning in partnership with the National Federation of Voluntary Bodies and their Child and Adult Safeguarding Committee. Um, before I start, and I always say this because I forget it at the end, um, I just want to thank Colleen Murphy in my office for her technical support in organising this morning, and Bridget McDade, who's up there in, 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 in Galway and uh, is assistant to moderate. Um, so, so, so thanks to both, indeed, everyone else in my office and in the National Federation. Um, as I said, this is a joint partnership between our office and the Office of the National Federation of Voluntary Bodies and in particular their child and adult safeguarding committee. I'll come along in a moment and I'll explain how we're going to run the seminar and, and I suppose a bit of why and who the people are, uh, both our, our, our speaker, Mary Kehoe Sullivan, and the members of the panel. I think it will be very interesting, very stimulating, and it will raise some really important questions around restrictive practices. Um, so thanks once again to, to Gillian Sexton in particular from, from the National Federation and our CEO, Alison Hartnett. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before I, I, I get into it. For people to know, this is a recording and there'll be an opportunity um, for our recording of this uh, webinar to be up on a number of websites. And uh, we will email out the people who come on today with um, links to both Mary's slides. And you'll see an opportunity to see um, the, 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 the recording of, of, of the presentation, the, the panel discussion and the questions. There is a chat function that side, if uh, as we go through, uh, Mary's presentation, and particularly um, as Mary will work through that, and we'll be having some case scenarios, we'd like to generate some discussion. Please um, send in some questions, and I know I've had some 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 questions in advance. So so thanks very much for that. The, the structure of, of the morning will be that Mary will, will, will present for about 30, 40 minutes, and we will take individual case scenarios and situations, case stories from your practice, uh, and particularly guided by the, the work that both Mary's done and our regulator has done in terms of the, the principles of this. Um, I suppose I'll, 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 before I introduce um, our, 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 our panelists, I just wanted to take a couple of moments just to say why, why ourselves and the, and the Federation organised this and, and why we went about inviting a number of, of, of panelists and, and Mary to, 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 to talk. I suppose we were very mindful of, at an international level, there's obligations on us as a health service. And as professionals, as workers, or healthcare workers, uh, and social care staff, uh, there's international obligations. Um, there's this UNCRPD obligations. And you know uh, we need to move to, and, and we are, but we need to continue that journey towards a human rights-based informed models of care. Very mindful that there is work ongoing to set in place um, structures for deprivation of liberty safeguards, but also um, that the commencement of ADM uh, assisted decision making will happen this summer. And we've waited a long time for that. And, and the need to progress in supporting people's decision making and their autonomy. Um, we're also very mindful that Mary and, and uh, would have been involved in the development of, of a number of guidelines that came out um, uh, both, both last year and previously around um, the development of uh, how we prevent the need for restrictive uh, uh, practices, some practical guidance and rights-based approaches to behaviour support, and indeed the work that, 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 that HICWA and, and we, uh, have, have also done around practice guidance and that human rights-based informed models of care and supporting people's autonomy. Um, I work in the National Safeguarding Office and I work with the nine safeguarding teams around the country. We'd also be aware that safeguarding issues arise and protection from abuse issues arise and can arise um, if uh, approaches aren't correct, if, if things aren't reviewed properly or the right um, guidance isn't applied in situations that can become an abusive context. And we'll touch on that later on. We're also mindful that in, 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 in inspection reports, it has been raised at times as a safeguarding issue. So really around today is to see how we can put the building blocks, the supports, the guidance, 
In an hour and a half, we don't have a chance to go through everything. We will touch on some areas. We're very mindful also that, that, that we may need to come back to this subject. Um, this very much is a day uh, or a morning, I should say, looking at practice guidance and, and very much the audience today is across um, service providers. We're delighted to such a large attendance and such a large interest in this topic. Um, but we may very well come back, particularly around the, maybe the focus on, on uh, service users themselves and working with advocacy organizations and hearing their voice and their input around um, uh, 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 what restrictive practices would mean. And we may very well come back to look at individual topics with professional <laughs> bodies and, and representative organizations. So, so I'm sure coming out of today, there'll still be more questions. Uh, and it's a huge topic. We could have probably uh, uh, covered elements of this on a whole morning. Um, so I'm just going to introduce um, my my panel, if I could, uh, and, and particularly our our, our speaker, um, Mary Kehoe Sullivan. I'm delighted that Mary uh, agreed to um, present on, on on her guidance. And uh, Mary was appointed a National Quality Improvement Specialist with the HC Disability Services and Community Operations back in in July 2017. And um, she, she works in the area of health and so she has worked in health and social care quality improvement for over 20 years in the US and uh, last 20 years in Ireland um, and has her more recent appointment before coming to the HSC as, as a director of standards and quality improvement with, with the Health Information Quality Authority. And I know the work that Mary has led on and often jointly with uh, uh, across a number of departments has been really, really important. So I'm delighted. Mary have, have that opportunity to hear from her today. Um, we have four members of our panel and I'm going to introduce them individually. I, we have Mick Keating and uh, Mick is a regional manager of responsibility for designated centres for persons with disabilities and was a key, as should have said, with, 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 with the Health Information Quality Authority. He was a key developer in, in HICWA's Restrictive Practice Thematic Programme and it's a number of you working in, 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 in um, services will know that. He's also had a lead role in embedding the human rights-based approach in disability services. Uh, and delighted to have Mick as uh, uh, part of our panel. Um, next, we have Dave Toomey. Dave is a principal social worker with Western Care Association uh, in the West of Ireland. He holds responsibility as a designated officer with, with the association. That's a very important role in, in the, the, the network of, of, of delivering safeguarding in this country. Um, his background is a mixture of qualifications in business studies, Montessori teaching and social work, and in recent years he qualified as a mediator. Uh, he's currently chairperson of the National Federation of Voluntary Bodies, Child and Adult Safeguarding Committee, and um, that committee has, has, has joined us in partnership to deliver today. Uh, David is joined by a colleague of his, um, uh, some of you may know Regina Chambers, she's a, a, a social work team leader also with Western Care, and she operates as, as a deputy, and she's also a designated officer, and she's a, 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 a deputy designated liaison officer for child protection concerns. She's worked in the area of disability and vulnerabilities uh, for all her professional career. Uh, she, uh, post-graduating as a social worker, she went on to complete five years psychotherapy training. She's an interest in social policy and currently is a part-time lecturer in the area of disability and social care as part of the social uh, studies degree in Mayo. So I'm delighted that um, David and Regina are joining us from Western Care. Uh, and our final member of our panel is Ruth Connolly. And Ruth is a chartered clinical psychologist and psych principal psychology manager at the Marissa Foundation. Uh, she leads a team of psychologists and behavior therapists and has worked with children and adults with intellectual disabilities and autism for over 25 years. Our interests include human rights-based approach to supporting adults who've experienced mental health difficulties and behaviours of concern. So I'm delighted that we have that panel. I'm delighted that, that we have such a broad focus. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Mary. And um, at, at various points, I'll step back in as Mary works through the guidance and uh, uh, we will look, and we're going to do this through some case scenarios and stories, I think, and the focus of that, as I understand, is, is to make this real for you out there as practitioners in this area. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to, to Mary. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, great to see you all here today. It's great to see there's such an interest in this area. Um, I'm just trying to get my slides up and running there now. So hopefully you are seeing the first slide or about to see it in just a few minutes. Um, so yes, as, as Tim said, I um, have a team um, that I work with that develop uh, practice guidelines and develop a lot of, do a lot of quality improvement work in disability services. We don't do it on our own. We do it very much in um, collaboration with our with disabled people themselves and with provider organizations across the country um, and, and HSC provided um, 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 services as well. So delighted um, to have an opportunity to discuss one of these um, documents that we've developed, actually a, a number of these documents have been developed over the last couple of years. Um, so I'm just going to just explain as well why we do guiding principles. You're probably all aware, well, you definitely will be all aware of the uh, Schedule 5 policies that are required by the regulations. And every designated centre must have these in order to be registered with HICWA. And um, when we started working, doing some work on this back in 2017, 2018, it would have been at the end of the first cycle um, of registration with HICWA. And that meant that every centre would have had these local policies. So it made no sense at all for us to start working on national uh, policies for each of those 21 policies. So what we did was we spoke with providers and asked them um, what were the difficulties in developing those policies and um, in revising them. And they would have told us that the most difficult part of it is because they're trying to do it in line with the HSC PPG uh, guidelines, development guidelines, the most difficult and time consuming part and the part that requires particular skills is the area around the research, looking at the research, the most up to date research. And um, so that's what we do. We um, have a group of people assisted very ably by the HSC library service. Um, and we develop guiding principles. And the idea of these is that they are then there as a support to you when you're revising your local schedule five policy. So we do in order to do this is we put a working group um, and that working group is made up of um, uh, specialists in the area. So for this particular working group around um, restrictions, we would have had psychologists, quality specialists, risk specialists, picks from around the country, assistant director, um, a couple of psychiatrists, psychologists, people from the NMPDU, um, CNS in behavior support, human rights specialists, training and development managers, the um, assisted decision making lead and um, the clinical lead for dementia, some researchers from NUIG as well as our own um, and practice development coordinators. And we also had the lead for Prada Willie syndrome um, because that's a, a particular uh, area as well that, that has to deal with restrictions. And um, so we put that group together um, and then very importantly, we engage with people whom we support. And this has very, very much evolved over uh, over the last couple of years. And I think in particular, it's the one positive thing we can say out of COVID. Um, heretofore, it was difficult to bring the people that we support to meetings. Um, it, it was very difficult just logistically to bring them up all up to meetings in Dublin and then have key support people there to work with them. So we've actually found that since um, uh, the pandemic and the use of Zoom and Teams and all of these um, online platforms that we've been able to engage much more fully with disabled people and we're delighted um, with that and, and with the people who support them. So that's the another part. So what we do is before we actually conduct the literature, we go out to um, to, to focus groups. Usually we just sit with the people um, that we support and their support workers um, and we ask them what it is about this particular policy that's important to them. We then conduct a literature review and we validate that using the agree tool because that's what's used in the PPG, the HSC PPG guidelines. Um, and we then out of the literature and also what the service users themselves have told us, we then identify a set of guiding principles. We turn those guiding principles then into a question uh, format, and that's your audit tool. So that when you're uh, devising or revising your local policies, you can use that audit tool as a guide. We've also developed a bespoke impact assessment tool that you can use within your organization to identify the impact on possibly training or resources that adhering to the guiding principles would have in your particular organization or designated center. And then once all that is done, then we have that signed off by an independent governance group that is chaired by Dr. Philip Crowley. Um, 
we provide you with all of those things then. So you see when we're giving you the table of contents that we give you all of those things so that you can see um, what has been used in the development of those particular guiding principles. Um, the ones that we're going to talk about today are the provision of behavioural support, and we've renamed this with HICRA's permission. Uh, we have renamed this, um, which would have been one of the Schedule 5 policies originally called, as, you, as I said, provision of behavioural support, and we, we've called it a rights-based approach to behavioural support. Equally, um, the, the Schedule 5 policy that was named in the Schedule 5 regulations as the use of restrictive procedures and physical and chemical environmental restraint, we have renamed that to preventing the need for restrictions. And because there is such a culture of change attached to it, we've also applied, developed a practical application document with case scenarios with that to accompany that. And we'll give you the links for, for all these documents at the end of the presentation. And they're also going to go through the case scenarios as part of this with our panel today. Um, so the introduction, as I said, um, so the, the table of contents of these uh, guiding principles would be, we give you the introduction, then we provide you with the internationally accepted definitions, uh, sometimes adapted from those to, to, to fit into our jurisdiction. We give you the guiding principles that have been devised arising from the review, the literature review, and the engagement with people that we support. We also give you our entire reference list so that you have that for yourself. And then in the appendices, you get the uh, impact assessment tool, the audit tool, the full agreement tool. Um, we, in this particular case, we're also giving you a list of the international legislation and policies. We talk about this um, um, concept called areas of concern of imminent harm. Um, so we've, we've given you some examples of that. We uh, bring in the UNCRPD, which of course is so important in all of this. And then we give you some national, international terms and definitions. Um, so the key thing for us here when we brought together this group, and it was quite a large group, 28 people, which was very large for, for our usual focus groups that we would have in our working groups rather than we would have working on guiding principles. Um, and the first thing that came about was this discussion around, you know, are we just going to, um, to do the same old thing? Are we going to make a, a significant impact here? Are we going to try to change the culture or are we just going to change the terminology? Um, and one of the things um, that was, was believed very strongly strongly by the group was that if you're actually developing a policy around the use of chemical, physical, environmental restraint, you're almost then saying that it's okay to use these things as long as there's a policy, you know, letting you know how you're supposed to do it. Whereas we felt that, no, we should be trying to shift that focus away from using restrictions, if at all possible, and using a human rights based approach. So, so that's 1 of the biggest changes and, and the, the regulator was ahead of us in this and that they would have come out with their human rights um, 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 restrictive practices uh, document just before we did this. So it was wonderful to have us all speaking from the same hymn sheet, so to speak. Um, the one of the things then as well, and we're not going to address it too much today, but um, is one that we'll probably do another webinar on is this use of chemical or medicine as a restraint versus the right to therapeutic medicine, because there is at uh, times when it is required, but it's again how it is done. And then this idea of a shift from the focus of the actual restriction to areas of imminent um, risk of harm. And we'll, we'll talk about that. And then it's about addressing that area of concern in whatever is the most appropriate way within the human rights framework. So we use the term restriction as opposed to um, the term um, restraint, which is uh, what is used in a, in, a, in a lot of other documents. And for us, we define a restriction as um, any practice strategy intervention or inaction that has the effect of limiting, controlling, monitoring, preventing, impeding the movement, rights, and our freedom of a person to act voluntarily with the primary purpose of protecting the person or others from imminent risk of harm. And as you can see there, we've adapted that from an Australian government document um, called the National Framework for Reducing and Eliminating the Use of Restrictive Practices in Disability Services. Um, as I said, had, um, 
also come out with the document. Um, I suppose the original would have been in the regulations. You can see there for yourself. I'm not going to read it out for you because I think you could see it there on the um, on the slide. And we're also going to be uh, giving you a copy of these slides afterwards. But there is a, a, a restrictive practice definition in the regulations. And then HIPAA themselves refined that definition in April 2016. And you can see that it's a practice that limits an individual movement, activity or function, interferes with an individual's ability to acquire positive reinforcement. It results in the loss of objects or activities that an individual values or requires an individual to engage in a behavior or action that the individual would not engage in given freedom of choice. And some of those examples then would be physical restraint, mechanical restraint, medication used as a restraint, environmental and psychosocial. Um, an area of imminent risk of concern, and, and I, I'm want to be very careful about this because when we start to change terminology, sometimes the terminology is doesn't sound self-evident. It's not it's not um, clear what exactly it means. So we wanted to ensure that you understood what we mean by area of concern of imminent risk of serious harm. So this is any condition or practice or situation which are such that the danger or risk exists, which could reasonably be expected to cause death or serious physical psychological harm to an individual immediately or before the imminence of such danger can be reduced or eliminated. And again, we've taken that from the Australian document. So when we came up with these eight um, uh, guiding principles, and these were, as I said again, arising from the literature and from the, the uh, engagement with our people that we support. So we've talked about a human rights-based approach compliance with legislation and that it's evidence-based, that we are working in capable environments. And I will explain that because, again, that's another um, new term that we're using, that there is sufficient governance and uh, sufficient oversight, that there is ongoing practice development and support for staff, that we are um, trying to um, have positive risk-taking and promote positive risk-taking because we all have a right to take risks in our lives. Um, emergency use then when, when there is an emergency and the language and terminology. I'm just going to go through those, um, those eight principles uh, right now. So the first one is that services practice a human rights model. Now, there's a number of uh, human rights models out there. Um, HICWA has used FRIDA. In uh, this particular document, we've used PANEL. Um, and PANEL just stands for participation, accountability, non-discrimination and equality empowerment and legality. Um, but the idea really here is that you're supporting people to live lives of their choosing that are informed by their human rights, by human rights principles. So we would ask that the rights and voice of each person is recognized, that it's a person-centered approach. Much of this language is, is not new and, and you will all be very familiar with this. Effective evidence-based ethical care and support acknowledges the importance of a capable and responsive environment and the quality of life outcomes find effective care and support. Our second one is compliance with legislation and national policy. And I think this one is a, is a no-brainer, really, um, that we just obviously must comply with all current legislation and national policies and the human rights uh, framework and any relevant future amendments. Because we know with the UNCRPD, with the, the work on the ADM, we know that things are changing into the future as well. So it's very important that we keep up with all those future policy changes. Um, and we do give um, an appendix, with, the, with, as I said earlier, with the relevant legislation and national policies. The third one is the one that the, uh, the language is a little uh, is new to people and this is this environment uh, this idea of a capable environment approach. Why the language may be new to you, the concepts aren't. This is the very same thing that we all strive for um, within the environments in which we work and in which we support people. So the 11 characteristics of a capable environment share two defining features. That environment that a person lives in would produce positive outcomes for individuals and their supporters, such as an enhanced quality of life. And that environment should also prevent the risk of imminent harm from occurring. And the 11 characteristics are that individuals are supported with positive social interactions, 
that they are supported to ensure that their communication skills and support needs are consistently recognised, responded to, and where communication is considered in all areas of the person's life. That an individual is supported to participate in meaningful activity using skill support that is sufficient to ensure success. That an individual is supported consistently in predictable environments and given support to understand and predict events with personalized routines and activities. That they are supported to develop and maintain relationships with friends and family. That they are offered choice and experiences which lead to more meaningful choices which are supported to be clearly communicated. That they are supported to try new experiences, develop skills and increase independence. That the individual is supported to in dignified ways to care for and look after themselves and their health. And this includes physical, emotional, sexual and spiritual. That they're supported in acceptable physical, home-like, work-like, leisure environments. That they're supported and skilled by and mindful staff who have the skills to lead all aspects of capable practice, including quality of life and areas of concern or risk of imminent harm, if applicable. We've also put in here that the DISMAT may be required to support the provision of individualized person-centered supports because we fully realize that they do cost additional money. Um, so uh, there are times where the DISMAT may be required to support the provision of individualized person-centered supports as needed throughout the person's lifespan to ensure that they continue to live in a capable environment. Fourth guiding principle then is governance and oversight. Again, this is nothing new to any of you, as service evidence is the four stages for care and support for an area of concern of imminent harm. Stage one is the identification and assessment of the area of concern, and that this is evidenced and completed by suitably qualified multidisciplinary professionals. Stage two is that the development of that plan to include the process of decision making and consent. And this is with the individual that we're supporting. The implementation of the plan is supported and evidenced and that correct notification has occurred and that the plan is evaluated. There are times when restrictions should not be used. They should never be used to force a person's cooperation or compliance. As an organizational convenience to compensate for limited staff and or skill, they should never be used due to limited resources or as a result of inappropriate or incapable environments. They shouldn't be used without proper assessment, government and due process. And obviously they should never be used as a form of abuse. And should any of these occur, a safeguarding concern should be raised in relation to an adult via the HSE adult safeguarding policy or a children's first notification made to TUSLA in relation to a child. It's very important that staff know their responsibility in escalating safeguarding concerns. So all staff members should be aware of the possibility that an inappropriate restriction may be considered a form of abuse under the HC adult safeguarding policy. Staff members should also be aware of their responsibility to respond appropriately and to raise an inappropriate use of a restriction as a safeguarding concern to their line manager and their designated officer. And TUSLA and the HSC safeguarding and protection teams are always available for advice and guidance. The sixth guiding principle is around ongoing practice development and support for staff. So again, this includes things like education, mentoring, reflective practice, debriefing and training on how best to support the area of concern of risk of imminent serious harm. But it also evidences a commitment to the prevention, reduction and elimination and in very limited circumstances, the use of a restriction with all stakeholders. And that includes the individuals that we support, family members and staff to include healthcare professionals. The sixth guiding principle is around positive risk taking. And again, this is where it can become very, very difficult for the individuals that we support and also the staff. 
we all have a right to take risks in our lives and it is no different for the person with an intellectual disability or a disability of any kind. They too have the right to do that, but it can sometimes be very difficult for staff to support those um, that, that risk taking. But then it is about trying to ensure that they have the supports to mitigate against the risks while at the same time supporting them to take those risks where at all possible. So we have to... And support individuals and give them the dignity of risk. It is recognized that as an individual leads more independent lives, the risk associated with activities in which they are involved is likely to increase. Robust risk management policies and procedures ensure that individuals are protected yet supported by staff and families to make decisions about the level of risk they wish to take, to develop skills to manage those risks, and to take responsibility for those risks. A step-by-step -step approach is practiced, which may include skills development, environmental adaptations, in education, etc., to enable an individual to gradually build the skills to partake in different tasks, activities, and experiences as they wish to do so. An emergency situation then, where there is imminent risk of serious harm. The support and response provided in an emergency should always ensure the safety of the individual, staff, and others. It should always occur within a caring and supportive relationship, and it should evidence a commitment to the non-use of restriction, aversive, or punitive means. Language and terminology is very important. Restriction and restraint are human rights issues, so we should avoid euphemisms when describing restriction. Policies and procedures should be accessible, dark and free, and written in plain English. Materials and technology are used and adapted to best meet the person's needs and abilities to understand the information they're given. Community, communication partners are suitably trained qualified professionals who value and adapt to a person's communication style and are competent to use a variety of communication approaches as appropriate to the individual that is being supported. We give you in the document some appendices um, of commonly noted areas of concern of imminent risk of harm and the relevant health and social care professionals who can assist with those. And, and that's as one of the appendices in the document. A rights-based approach, then, I just wanted to, I suppose, highlight this for you. We also developed the rights-based approach to behavioural support guiding principles, and that's the one about the provision of behavioural support, because, as you know, they're completely interlinked. Um, the, the provision of behaviour support um, and the, the anything to do with restrictions are, are inextricably linked, really. Um, and, and for that reason, we have many of the same people on the two working groups, and you will see that many of the, um, the guiding principles are very similar as well. Um, such as the human rights model, again, compliance with legislation, some of it is different, some of it is the same, but understanding the needs, concerns as expressed and communicated through behaviour. So with our uh, positive behaviour um, rights-based approach, we're looking at uh, the fact that these behaviours are, they're, they're, they're calls for help because they're identify that the person is in some type of distress. So we're avoiding things like behaviors that challenge, challenging behaviors, behaviors of concern. What we're trying to say is that this behavior is being caused by that person being in distress. So is it the environment that they're living in? Um, is it that they're in pain? Is there some kind of illness? So these, this is the approach that we're taking to these particular guiding principles. And again, the, the same oversight, ongoing practice, education, development. And um, the other one of these that's slightly different is our guiding principle number six, because it's about decision making and problem solving when balancing safety, risk of harm and freedom of choice. And the number seven is responding in the moment to the person's need. And the final one, again, is language and terminology. So, so those again, those are our eight guiding principles, the human rights based approach, compliance with legislation and that they're evidence based, that we're working as far as possible in capable environments for the people we support, that there is sufficient governance and, and oversight, that there is ongoing practice and development to support for staff, that we are promoting positive risk taking and supporting people to mitigate against those risks. What you need to do in the case of an emergency and imminent risk of harm, and that the language and terminology needs to avoid euphemisms and be friendly and accessible to everybody that we're working with.
So I'm going to hand over now to Tim and we're going to um, talk about some of the case scenarios that were that are in the preventing the, uh, the, the need for restrictions, a practical guidance um, too. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mary, and, and thanks for, for going through the guidance and, and the principles around the pen. I think it's really important and uh, excellent presentation. Um, so what we're going to change tack a small bit, I suppose, in terms of, of uh, we're going to bring this, try and make this real. Um, we have a lot of practitioners, people who work in services, people who work to support um, people's decision making and autonomy out there in organisations. So we're going to look at some of the, the, the case examples and the studies, and I'm going to involve the panel as we walk through these. Um, you have the chat function, Bridget um, in my office, along with Gillian from, from the Fed, uh, are going to um, receive in any questions as we walk through the um, the various stories and the scenarios. And it's really trying to make sense. We're not come, we're not here to to kind of uh, find the answer, uh, but it's really much what it brings up, what needs to be considered, how do we balance the various considerations around people's rights and then the risks that might be involved. So I'm going to start with J Jessica's story, and I'm going to read it out and um, I'm, uh, uh, and. Yes, Jessica is a 48-year-old woman who lives in supported living. She likes to shop in charity shops each week, spending 20 euros approximately in a range of items. Over the last few months, she has had difficulty paying her phone bill, and last week she did not have enough money to pay her rent. She now owes 120 euros. Staff have suggested that they hold her bank card to help manage her money. So this is a very real example of... Um, the, 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 the concern around someone's finances. So I'm going to bring David in from, from Western Care in terms of, of how you would approach that. You're a service provider, you're a, 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 a designated officer or you're a support person, and but also what would be the approach uh, and the considerations here, David, in, in considering Jessica and, and working with Jessica here. Okay, thank you, Tim, and good morning, everybody. I suppose before we even move into Jessica's exclusive story, I would think uh, right across the country uh, we can all relate to this particular scenario. Um, I know I have a particular interest in the area of supporting individuals to live independent lives with discrete support where it is required. And when I look at Jessica, uh, I can think of many, many Jessicas uh, that I've worked with. in today. And one of the things listening to Mary and the outline of what she was talking about, there's lots of guidance there that we can actually engage with when we look at these documents with regard to how somebody can support Jessica in the dilemma that Jessica brings. I suppose one of the things then I'm thinking about as I, as I just look at Jessica's story and from my own experience is no one staff member, not one staff member should ever feel alone in relation to supporting a case like this. Because um, starting from the foremost, absolutely, Jessica is the lead person in Jessica's story. Jessica is a decision maker in Jessica's story. And when we're looking at staff engaging with situations like Jessica, we have to share the learning. And also, I think, and from my experiences, you can feel a lot of pressure when you learn a situation like this, and you can go into, and I won't say a panic mode, but you can go into, how can I resolve this today? What do I do about it today? What can I really do? And you shouldn't be left alone with that. And that's one of the messages I would put out there, looking at Jessica's story to, to everybody, that regardless of what agency you work for, what support staff you are, you should not be alone in, in relation to your journey with Jessica supporting her uh, in the dilemmas that face her. Um, as you say, Jessica's a 48-year-old lady. She's living with supported uh, um, uh, kind of a living arrangements. Now, as we look across our own agencies across the country, that could mean different uh, things for different people. And when I mentioned discrete support earlier on, I would know from, from many people we support and are supported across in their living situations, that might mean somebody having one hour support a day or two hours support a day, or perhaps some hours peppered throughout the week at essential times, or for someone like Jessica, she can contact. Because fundamentally, Jessica has the right to live her own life. Mm. 
the reason that, that she's spending 20 euro uh, in the read right there on the charity shops, I think everybody is a frequent visitor to charity shops. I don't think spending 20 euro in a charity shop is anything to be shocked about. I think it's interesting. And immediately we can see that, that that's something Jessica is focused on. There's an affordable opportunity to buy clothes in a charity shop. That's obviously identifying an interest that she has. And then as we move on in Jessica's particular story, we're saying, okay, but there are difficulties arising for Jessica. And she's had some challenges in relation to her phone bill. And what she's saying there is recently she's had lacking money to support herself in relation to paying her own rent. And she owes the landlord or the rental situation 120 euro. Now, in the big wide world of things, 120 euro is not a massive amount of money. Mm. Uh, and we're looking at there that staff is suggesting, which can be a reaction. Perhaps we need to move into some element of control, like mm. maybe pulling back uh, Jessica's bank card. Now, going on, Mary, what you've outlined earlier on, and going on our own experience, that's not something that we move towards. So I think mm. the starting point with Jessica acknowledging that there are many Jessicas uh, out there is. I suppose you mentioned earlier on a human rights approach, a personal centered approach. So we start with Jessica. So mm -hmm. what's Jessica's feeling around Jessica's situation? Jessica mightn't be worried terribly about owning or owning uh, this amount of money. Uh, mm -hmm. Jessica may have a particular plan in relation to how she manages her affairs. And I think the starting point has to be talking with Jessica with regard to how she sees things for herself. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And Tim, I don't know, and we all know, is yeah. the last thing I want in my life is somebody trying to explore every aspect of my life, me sure. coming up with an answer. Um, but the, from a staffing point of view or a support point of view, looking at the whole area of safeguarding, our concerns are, is Jessica safe? Is Jessica maybe experiencing some sort of exploitation in relation to where is her money going? So I think this has to be in a kind of a a particular focused point of view. And uh, Mary, you mentioned from what, what I listened to you earlier on around communication. And I think that's a key point. So it is around the perspective of engaging with Jessica. Jessica is the, the lead person. Jessica is like, but how we communicate. Because if you're going to ask me a question about something I do, I might be cagey. I might want to open up. And also, I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know if you're feeling like, are you, am I in trouble because I owe 120 quid? Am I going to lose my living arrangements? Can I not shop anymore? And do you need access to my phone to discover how much I'm spending? There's a whole array sure. of issues of concern that I think need to be looked at and also an understanding in relation to like an onslaught. There are things that you mentioned the uh, policies and procedures that lie within agencies. I mean, there are your in-house policies in relation to supporting individuals with money. So there's many in-house policies that people that who are working to support uh, Jessica need to be informed of as they go through supporting Jessica and all the Jessicas as, as, as we go forward. And uh, uh, Mar you also mentioned supervision. I'm a key believer in supervision because I think when you bring supervision into this room, um, if I'm going to work with Jessica tomorrow and I'm being well supervised and I'm working with Tony yesterday or Marie the day before yesterday, I'm bringing that knowledge base into the situation with Jessica. I suppose there's other things that strike me just as I look at it. It's a very short little story, but within that store, short story, there's a novel because there's everything in relation to Jessica's life. There's her living, there's her money, there's her interests. And, you know, one could say, Okay, Jessica's in a situation there. Uh, we could say, how can we help? And I think it isn't how can we help. I think what we need to do as staff supporting individuals is to be helpful. Differentiate, I mean, there with helpful is if we're being helpful, what we're doing is we're working with somebody so that they're learning, we're learning, and we're having a helpful approach. Because sometimes, if we say, I'm going to go in there and help me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go there, I'm going to find, can I get 120 quid somewhere to pay off Jessica's bill? I'm going to talk to her landlord and say, can I reduce 
the kind of rates to bring it down. And that's not the starting point. So it's not about being helped, mm -hmm. it's about being helpful, having a kind of an overlook of just the situation. There are other things in relation to Jessica's understanding of her own situation with regard to her finance. I mean, I don't know, and we all know, I actually am a father of teenagers as well, and I know what data can do to a bank account. I know what I'm mobile sure do, David. <laughs> David, 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 questions. I'm just looking at some of the questions coming in here on, on the chat box, and, and, and you've covered a lot of this around that making Jessica the centre and the importance of building that relationship and yes. trying to understand where she sees her relationship with money um, but also a question coming in here about why would services or people sometimes move to try and to quote, quote, control that type of maybe that it, where it might be always the most proportionate or necessary immediate response. But sometimes it's the response that people go towards. Why would that happen, that, that, that more uh, relationship based one to try and build her trust where it, sometimes there might be that move to let's have a more controlled approach. Why does that sometimes happen, David? Yeah, I will, I, when you say why does it, I think that's a failure because I don't think the approach has to be one coming from control. Right. And I think part of uh, my experience, part of my understanding was from the get-go, from the start, if we're going to be involved in Jessica's life, there has to be a starting point. So if I'm going to be involved in Jessica's life, um, Jessica needs to understand why am I there? Like, what's my role? And if Jessica is being supported by four staff, three staff, two staff, what's the agency role? So Jessica actually is engaging with us. And then Jessica is outlining to us what Jessica would like to see us do in her life. The control thing, I think, can come from we get to know someone's situation um, and we begin to look at it thinking, geez, I wouldn't want that for me, or I wouldn't want that for someone I love. And we move into this kind of uh, oversight view, thinking, well, we can fix that, we can fix this, we can fix that. Okay. Everybody, everybody has to take risks. You mentioned risk yourself, Mary, in your early presentation. Everybody has to take risks. I'm not losing any sleep if Jessica owes 120 quid. I'm not losing any sleep. I would like to think Jessica would. But going back to your control one, I think the starting point from today, from tomorrow, whoever we're working with, we have to revisit and say, why am I in this person's life? And then in relation to why does this person want me in their life? Maybe why does this person perhaps need me in their life? And I Sorry, David, whatever David, type of support there is there. There is an engagement with the community. Bob, did I bop? Did I bop? Yeah, I think we might have a slight difficulty with the sound there, David. Um, Sorry, did you lose me there? Are we okay? We lost you there oh for God. a moment, David. Yeah, and can you hear me now? Yeah, no, you're fine. You're okay. Okay, well, I can hear you perfectly I've lost, there now. I've lost all the visual, so with losing all the visual, it seems to have enhanced the sound. So I apologize, you're hearing me now without seeing me. But I suppose, uh, Tim, I'm, I'm interested okay. in the control because in relation to a case like Jessica, I'm just thinking we have to remind ourselves from a person centered point of view, it is starting with Jessica, it is looking at Jessica's needs. I mean, yeah. we might have a and I think thinking. that's been reflected. Yeah, we've had some very good, I mean, I won't be able to share them all, but some very good commentary in on the chat box around and um, supporting her and, and facilitating enabling her own money management and around, um, you know, managing housing supports. So, um, Thanks very much, David. I, we could we could spend maybe the whole morning on on know, Jessica's yeah. story and and the kind of balances that are there around autonomy and independence. Uh, but thanks very can much I for highlighting that, those. Can I mention one thing before we cut off in this? And I think it's yeah. I just think it's important. Just looking at the uh, coming forward of the assistant the, the decision making act and the, the you know the uh, coming into the summer of 2022, and in advance of that, we should be working in the spirit of the act. And working in the spirit of that is working from the person's perspective. The person is a decision maker. The person, no one makes a decision without engaging. And I think that can help us going forward that we actually say there's an approach there. 
I know Tim, we need to move on, but I just wanted to get that in there. Yeah, All you right. know, a really important point and a really important principle with the with the commencement of, 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 of ADM. Just a point there, I know a couple of people are experiencing some difficulty around connection and sound. I understand maybe if you if you stop the video, you might be able to hear uh, it could be a broadband uh, a connection. So in, in some of these, I'll read out the stories and you can still hear the discussion. So um, maybe you might not always be able to view the visuals. So I'm going to come on next to, to Jimmy's story. And the um, story here is J Jimmy is a 37 year old man who lives in a group home and he has a learning disability and uh, he's on the autistic spectrum disorder, or sorry, has an autistic spectrum disorder. Jimmy has also been uh, a placid calm man who can get very excited and agitated when his routine is changed. Recently, due to COVID-19 restrictions, he's no longer been able to go to his day services regularly and his visits home to his parents have been curtailed due to the public health guidelines and the risk of infection. Since this has happened, he has become very distressed, is not sleeping at night and keeps other residents awake in the house due to his loud screams. Um, Jimmy has also started uh, high pitched screaming at times during the day for no apparent reason. Due to the complaints from other residents, his staff have asked for the GP to treat his agitation and asked for sleeping tablets and PRM medication to stop him screaming. I think this is a, a scenario and, and a difficulty and, and a challenge for people working with um, cross COVID and trying to support people uh, in a very difficult time of restrictions. Um, Ruth, I'm going to bring you in here from your, your clinical role and your therapeutic role um, and to, to kind of look at how we, um, I suppose, support someone experiencing such emotional and psychological um, upset or distress during, during COVID, which is very real, and, and, and also our balance for our concern for our other residents and the people we, we, we work with and maybe, maybe uh, uh, how you'd like to comment and the, you know, the, 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 the bit like the last suggestion, there was a, a, a move in the last one to, to control the money, there's a move here to, to look at, 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 a, at, a, at a medication option. So do you, want to, do you want to make some commentary and observations on that from uh, your, your, your clinical psychology perspective? I would indeed. Thanks, Tim, for, for inviting me to be here today. And thanks, Mari, for getting me involved in these two pieces of work initially around the, um, the human rights approach to behaviour supports, um, which we completed in 2020, and it, which is really linked to this piece of work as well. And, and Mari um, will, will be witness to the fact that it can be very difficult to get a room of professionals and psychologists and psychiatrists and OTs and speech and language therapists and social care workers to, to agree. So I think she did a masterful job in, in helping us to really come up with some guiding principles. Um, one of the things that strikes me is the timeliness of the webinar today. Um, we've never, we've never uh, had as much experience in our own lives of restrictions as we've had in the last two years. And if we were ever able to empathise with the people that we support and provide services to, we're really well, well set to do that at the moment. Um, all of our lives have been heavily restricted over the past two years um, and often with blanket rules. And um, and sometimes, you know, things that had had significant impact on our ability to see our family and friends or to attend funerals. So I think the idea of a human rights approach and a shared common humanity really, really helps this work. And today is really the first step in raising awareness around an approach to this work. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the process rather than the content, because there's a lot of content there in, in Jimmy's yeah. story. And um, so, so as psychologists I tend to spend a lot of time thinking really, well, well, what, what, is the, what are the critical thinking skills that we need to be able to assist? And um, none of us come into to this area of work to um, impose human rights restrictions on people's lives. And yet we, we've inherited legacy issues. And um, a lot of the people that we support um, have lived in situations for years where their rights have been restricted from day one because they're not allowed to leave. Um, and where there's a huge differential um, of power and control between the staff who are there to, to enable them to have good lives and, and around decision making. And this is really difficult stuff. And with, with the, um, the enactment of the, um, the assisted decision making legislation and with the UNCRPD, it's a really exciting time to change the paradigm, to change the way that we work. Um, so I'd like to encourage people to, to, to 
make sure that, that, that today is not about finding easier ways to write up restrictive practices. Today is about going back and looking at situations where, where we're working and to become an activist and to go actually, like, is this a restriction? Would I want this in my life? Um, <clears throat> so there's a level of ambiguity about all of this and there are no clear cut answers and, and the case study um, document that's an accompanying document to the principles document is there to be used back in, in, in your teams um, as exercises to kind of raise questions and to apply uh, the eight principles. Um, in terms of Jimmy, um, even looking at how we write the description, there's something a little bit dehumanizing. And, and one of our principles is around language and terminology. We've reduced Jimmy straight away to, to being a 37 year old man with a disability and autism, which tells us so little about his life and about who he is as a person. Um, so it would be impossible to come up with the right answer, just given the information in this scenario. But if we were to apply the eight principles, we'd start by looking at, at a human rights based approach. So um, there's clearly areas of concern of imminent risk of harm, and there could potentially be imminent risk um, around Jimmy's physical or mental health if he's showing signs of acute distress. There could be um, imminent risk to his housemates if they are and experiencing being around somebody who's very distressed and that might be quite frightening so there could be safeguarding concerns and um, there's um, a request from staff to ask the GP to treat agitation which, which isn't an unusual request we often we often hear that and a request for sleeping tablets and PRN medication um, and we could we could presume that that's a request to use medication as a restriction and this could be a very stressful working environment for staff and um, it could be an environment where people don't know what to do and um, so how can our guiding principles help us well initially a human rights based approach to behavioral support would suggest we should really spend time with jimmy and figure out um, how does jimmy let us know when he's distressed and has he shown that he's distressed before and we should refer back to our guiding principles around how do you figure out what to do when somebody is showing distress through um, uh, behaviours of concern or through um, a, a way of communicating um, and figuring out through Jimmy and through his circle of support and through the people that know him well what we need to do to determine what this means. Um, so we need to look at the compliance with legislation. We need to think about our local policies around how we support people who are distressed. We need to think about the HSE safeguarding policy. Are there safeguarding issues here? But really importantly, even though it might seem like the right thing to do in a quick fix, it's important not to jump in and to try and, and stop Jimmy's communication of his distress by getting him to sleep by using sleeping tablets and using medication to stop the distress. And that can be really hard because we all come into this work to help people and, um, and it's very hard to be around people who are distressed. Um, so if the next, um, if we were to look at capable environments, so this, this is, um, this is some writing by by Peter McGill from the, the Tizard Centre, which is really helpful when we're looking at these kinds of situations. We need to look at the, the situation that Jimmy is living in and, and think about is there compatibility between Jimmy and his the environment he's living in? And, and one really simple way of thinking about that is like, is it a home? Because sometimes we talk about homes, but actually they're not really homes. And maybe the definition of a home is somewhere that you don't want to escape from. So, so is this a home in the real sense? Did, did Jimmy choose to live there? Is he surrounded by um, people that he wants to live with and who want to live with him? Um, is he supported by staff who feel supported themselves? Um, does he have relationships? Um, how does he let the people in his life know that there's something wrong? Um, because of COVID, has there been changes to his key relationships? And is that in itself a reason for distress? And certainly my experience down through the years in supporting people who are autistic and have an intellectual disability is that 
these are the population who possibly are most at risk of restrictive practices or abusive interactions when we don't have the correct staff and staff don't feel properly supported. And we, we know this through, I suppose, unfortunate events that have happened sort of in the UK and scandals there and also um, in, our, in our own country in recent years. Um, okay, so governance and oversight, what are our responsibilities around that? Well, there are lots. Um, we need to think about are we are we adhering to our own policies and procedures and is there organizational oversight like do we do we look at things like prescribing practices that's come up very recently it's very topical at the moment in light of what's happened down in Kerry do we have good policies to look at you know the people that we support and their medication and it's not just around PRN medication it can be around the use of medication when there isn't a good rationale for saying often put in for, for the best will in the world and the best reasoning at the time, but maybe not reviewed regularly enough or not questioned. So we'd encourage people to always approach this with an open curiosity and to ask, ask the right questions. And is there oversight for, at an organizational level? You know, are, are we looking to see, um, is there, are there restrictions put in place? Is there an overuse of, of sleeping tablets or, or medications rather than um, a process of trying to figure out what's really going on and, and do we audit things like restrictive practices and and reduce them over time and do we look at our prescribing practices over time do we look to see if our behavior support plans are actually working do we look to find out if our staff feel supported but most importantly do we do all of this in collaboration with jimmy because we've come from a history of doing things to people and people being passive recipients of care to now getting into the territory where we figure out things together and that we don't do things without their consent. And again, if I can go a little bit off topic, I think one of the really helpful things during the, the, um, the COVID pandemic was the work that we did on ensuring that people um, really took time to help the people we support around the um, swabbing process and also the vaccination process. And I think we learned that um, the, the application of consent is not a once off event, that it's a process that we're constantly checking in, that it, it evolves and that all of us have the ability to have these conversations. So I'll just I'll just hit on some of the other um, principles if we were to oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Am I going over time, Tim? Feel free to, to no, join. No, no, you're excellent. I, I, I think you're really covering some really important um, principles here about how we approach and, and work with people rather than to people, as you say. Yes, and I think I think that's going to be a challenge for us all because it's so much easier to to write a, a list of recommendations or to agree as a multidisciplinary team what should happen for a person and also to comply with legislation it's to some extent it's easy to send in a notification to HICWA or to send in a report to to HSE safeguarding it's much harder to sit down with Jimmy and his supporters and really figure out what is the right the right support to to be and to make sure that that Jimmy is the person leading out on that um, and sometimes we have to make really difficult decisions and sometimes if we find out that actually this isn't a capable environment well we really shouldn't be trying to patch it up we shouldn't be trying to put in a behavior support plan and we certainly shouldn't be resorting to restrictive practices we should be um, act, you know, being uh, like saying that really that, like the effect of, uh, of an incapable environment is a safeguarding issue in itself. And um, so so Jimmy's case raises all sorts of issues for us, yeah. issues around um, like living in the right environment, having the right support and um, thinking about medication and the rationale for same and not jumping in with medication unless we've done a really good assessment that looks at the biopsychosocial um formulation and and looks at front loading supports with psychosocial supports initially before resorting to things that maybe are more more of a rights restriction and that's not to say that medication isn't doesn't have a role it often has a really helpful role in conjunction with other other supports yeah. so i i hope that some of those no, yeah, issues that's very good just, just one observations are coming across and um, um, from um the chat box there is that the and i really welcome your 
um, perspective about having that mind of open curiosity and the need for strong governance and oversight. But really what, what struck me and has come up in, 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 is that what is a capable environment? How do we want to create a home? If somebody is working as a social care leader and a, a nurse social worker in a service, you know, and, and actually feels it isn't the right environment or it isn't a capable environment, have you any ideas of how you open that conversation with your colleagues and your managers and your people that, that, that it can be a difficult conversation to open? that you might feel actually is not the right environment it's not even with the right supports and uh, have you any view on that i've, I've really strong views on this tim and i and this could be a whole other <laughs> webinar and how you open that conversation yeah. but, but i think I, I i think it's important that we're able to like we talk about cultures of psychological safety and, and a really well functioning team is a team where people are allowed to say what they really think and, and not and not fear that they're going to get into trouble for saying that and that applies to the people that we support just as much as the staff that we support because certainly I, I work with people who've come from maybe congregated settings and and staff who are, are service users a terminology that i hate but people often refer to themselves in in, in that language who are afraid to tell us what they really think for fear of getting into trouble and staff often feel the same so i think like when we step into this new paradigm, we need to encourage like open curiosity and ability to raise concerns without being shot down. And sometimes being able to sit with the discomfort of knowing that it might take some time to come up with the right solution, but being yeah. brave enough to raise the concern. And thanks very much for, for stating that, because I think that's, that's a really important point that we create those working environments where people can feel comfortable raising difficult challenges. Um, if it's okay, um, uh, uh, we'll move on. Thanks very much, um, Ruth, and excellent. Uh, Mary, I might just actually skip to Tom's story, just to, from a time perspective, if that's okay. And we'll come back to, to, um, to, to Sam's uh, story, if I can, if that's, if that's okay. Just a mindful of times, and there is some general, one or two general questions. So um, this is Tom's story. Um, Tom is a 37-year-old autistic man who lives in a group home with three other men. Tom drinks high volumes of fluid, water, milk, yogurt, and staff recorded that Tom can drink an average 11 to 12 litres of fluid per day, and on one occasion up to 23 litres results in hospitalisation. Um, when Tom is redirected from the kitchen tap, Tom may go to the bathroom and use a vessel to drink from the toilet, or uh, he may say no water. The staff team have been advised that this is medically unsafe for Tom to drink more than three litres of water every day. Staff are unsure how they're going to manage this advice. So I'm going to ask both, both uh, Regina from Western Care and Mick from, from ECO on this. Maybe if I start with you, Regina, in terms of your observation about the, 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 the balance here between risk and, and, and Tom and his liberty and safety. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm so busy with this morning. Um, I think it's I'm not sure if your volume is okay there. Try again, Regina. Yep, I can hear you perfectly now. Okay. Um, I suppose it's important to start off and say, Tim, thanks for the invite. And also, it's um, I feel privileged to share the space this morning with people who are passionate about improving the lives of people that we support. It's it's a it's a it's a nice space to be in. Um, also, I suppose. Like Ruth just said, I think we're at, I suppose, the point of um, a really exciting time in social care in that we're actually really actively thinking um, about other people's rights that maybe we haven't spent enough time on in the past. So I think it's an opportunity to embed uh, good practice and also, I, I suppose, as we go forward to kind of um, human rights base kind of focus on all of the um, the decisions that we make in people's lives, I suppose, as also as an assurance in terms of um, social care students coming into this field at the time at this time, I can tell you that um, the human rights based approach is very much part of the education system at this time. And again, like Ruth said, you know, having people that are able to to open up in an environment and name it for what it is, if it's not functioning, if it's not capable that people feel able to to raise that and have the confidence and the assurance in themselves, it's really important. Um, so 
just before I start looking at Tom's story, a little bit again, like other people would have said, you can feel sometimes the panic in the story, which is get get it sorted and get the problem resolved. And I I totally understand that. And sometimes we might do that at haste at a cost because we might miss out on the actual real picture. Um, so just looking at, I suppose, um, engaging with Tom and making sure that he's part of the decision making, which is his right, would be to, I suppose, um, examine as to how Tom would choose to be supported, um, talk to his family, staff and those who would know him well, and, and others that may have a good connection um, and a relationship with him. And again, the problem solving in all of this isn't down to one person, it's a real team effort and we all play a part in it okay and um, so really involving him and remembering that it starts with him um i suppose looking at the looking at the the risks involved you're you're exploring again in a very open um discussion manner is whether thomas had the opportunity to have a full medical dental mental health review you know and you'd be considering um possible health issues for him like diabetes um, other uh, specific disorders, um, again, as I suppose, as part of the ruling out, which we would tend to, uh, to try and do from a kind of a biological uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. moving to the, I suppose, a rights-based um, approach to behavioral support, is there any body of evidence um, that can help us understand Tom's need for drinking excessive amounts of water? Because it may not be in any way related to any physical or mental or any other and um, organic issue and um, as he has a sense has, is there any sensory profile that informs us um, and um, is he confused about some information about drinking water and um, is there a possibility of um, building some um, skill development or can we work with him to encourage positive risk taking um, again Ruth said there just before me um, looking at his quality of life overall, okay, uh, to review, to look at Tom's life on a 24 hour basis, um, is it person centered, is it meeting his, is this a living environment that he's currently in meeting his needs, um, is it the best environment for him, um, uh, and again, I suppose another part of the, of the um, good practice um, and the guidance is looking at how we communicate with Tom. Do we do we understand um, his communication system? Does he have a communication profile? Um, is that understood by the people immediately in his environment? And if it's not, there might be training to be done. It's it's not it's not um, it's okay to say I don't fully understand him. I don't um, get where, when he speaks. I need I need help and support in this. But somebody else might. And to be open to have that dance in order to get it right for somebody. Um, uh, looking at things like does he have a communication passport does he have behavioral support plan that's meaningful that's worked that's reviewed does he have a stress management plan and um, does he have any uh, trauma-informed plan that we need to be making part of his daily life um again just lots of questions is tom's autism understood in terms of how it impacts on him as a person um does he have meaningful and actual supports and positive relationships? Um, uh, again, you know, when you're thinking of managing the risks, you know, possible plans to provide um, uh, safe levels of fluid um, to him throughout the course of the day, offering autonomy as much as possible, and very practical small things like smaller glasses and, you know, from a sensory point of view, is it is the feeling of yeah. fluid? So there's a real sense of um, I suppose exploration and building in the time to allow people to get to the to the real issue as opposed to running in to stop the behavior. And um, mm. I suppose the other thing that's highlighted in the Tom story is the fact that he shares um, his service with three other um, people. And it goes without saying that their lives shouldn't be impacted by this and they should always have free and full access to fluids. Um, on an ongoing basis. I think one of the things that I would sometimes uh, suggest when we're asked to go in and support in these situations would be that while we're looking at Tom, that we sometimes maybe identify another group of people 
as the advocates and the upholders of other people's um, human rights to make sure that other people, their rights are being also kind of put to the top of the agenda. And we're clear that making a good decision for Tom doesn't impact on someone else. Um, I suppose that's a lot of information to consider. Yeah, um, no, it's very, very helpful, um, Regina. And, and, and I suppose I see it on the message box here about the need to do that holistic medical and physical and, 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 and look at it, but also in terms of, of how important it is to try and understand him and yeah. understand uh, 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 what's behind it and what the understanding of autism. Um, I'm going to bring in Mick um, uh, Keating there from, from HICWA in terms of, I know you, you, you've been involved in, in, in developing the, the human rights based approach and the thematic uh, 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 inspections on, on to do with, with restricted practice. Do you have a comment around, around this in terms of approach and, and the kind of work you've been leading in from the regulator perspective? Yeah. Thanks, Tim. And again, just to echo the sentiment of everybody else, it's really great to be here and to see the number of participants on such a busy at such a busy busy time. I suppose speaks volumes around people's wishes and desires to, to reduce and remove the, the need for restrictive practices. Um, listen, I'm here representing HICWA. I'm not going. To, I'm not here to quote the regulations and the standards. People know what the regulations and the standards are. But again, it's in terms of the principles that you know that the, the, the are being launched here today, um, are very much in tandem with the, the the HICWA guidance in relation to all of us trying to work towards creating and promoting more restraint-free environments for for people who use our services. Um, I think look to to look at Tom's example in particular. Um, there's no doubt, and I mean some of these scenarios are just show how. Some, some of the difficult challenges frontline staff and managers have um, in, in terms of managing some of these really difficult situations. And and as Regina said, when somebody, the, the, I suppose the, the added complexity of the fact that, you know, this this person is living in a group home makes it all the more difficult to manage. Um, because assuming all of the medical reasons, as Regina has set out, have been explored uh, for the reasons for, um, you know, the, the Tom wanting to access such high volumes of fluids, assuming that all those have been explored, um, it, it would appear that there is a medical reason as to as to have to put some sort of a limit on the amount of fluids that this, this resident can drink, can drink. And, you know, so I suppose it, it's, it's the difficulty in managing, you know, polydyspia or, or excessive thirst um, and and the, the problems that, that that can face I guess during the restrictive practice um thematic inspections we did we did come across uh, one center and um, just to give an example that was was um, a highly restrictive environment for this very reason um, and again this person was living in a group home and as a result access to water in bathrooms in kitchen sinks and in, in everywhere throughout the home was was severely restricted valves were turned off to prevent people from being able to access the water and um, but yet there was only only one resident in, in that center who who had an issue with with accessing fluids um, so I guess you know as Ruth talked about earlier on as well we have to be honest sometimes and look at the compatibility of residents and see is this a is this a suitable environment for somebody to be living in you know um i mean realistically you know the creation of comfortable safe relaxed environments where individuals feel valued valued confident and secure reduces the need for restrictive practices again in mm -hmm. this example um we we found a very very restrictive environment and you know the provider did a lot of work and used all of the guidance and all of the mdt supports and inputs and really explored this and um you know i i, I was back out in that center recently um and what was really great to see was that they had really, I suppose, been innov innovative in the way that they looked it, they looked at, at how to explore this. Um, and they had created, I, I, I guess you would call it a, 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 an apartment style living environment within the group home where Tom's equivalent, let's call him, lived. Um, and mm -hmm. they um, looked at, you know, they had all of the medical interventions and the medical rationale behind it. Um, and they, you know, they, they put in, um, for example, they put in a fresh water tank in the attic um, with a special release valve that only released, uh, I think it was 500 milliliters every every hour or every two hours. I can't remember the exact the exact uh, okay. amount of water that was released. There was a push button tap provided um, and a timer on the tap as well. Um, so, you know, look, it's still a restrictive environment.
environment, but it's a less restrictive environment. And that's what we're always aiming to try and achieve. It's that, um, and, and, you know, as, as was said at the beginning of this as well, I think David said it, you know, no person should be on their own making, making decisions in relation to restrictive practices. It's essential that staff, frontline staff in particular, have adequate support around them. And it and it's also should be acknowledged that they are the people who know that resident the best in many cases, so that the, their input is just as valuable at, M, at any MDT meeting in relation to implementing a restrictive practice. And finally, I guess in relation to Tom's story, for me, it, and, and you know, Regina touched on this, it's around that positive behaviour support plan. You know, if this resident is doing very little other than being in his living environment all the time, well, then he is he has little else to do other than to continue to try and access water at all times. So, you know, what kind of community engagement does he have? What kind of staffing supports does he have? Um, you know, uh, so it, it's it's to explore in, in its totality and not just jump to their, their restriction. Yeah, Mick, w w one question that's come in on the on, on the chat box there was around the um, where providers for maybe medical or health reasons um, feel something is necessary and proportionate, and um, it could be the the, the area of uh, of safe mobility or risk of falls, um, uh, as well as obviously the example here around restriction of water or food. And um, um, as I suppose some providers might be, feel that they they've got the evidence base there, and maybe the regulator might take a different perspective on 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 their approach. How how? best is, is to try and progress that where there might be a, a, a difference of kind of perspective around what the necessity there uh, and sure. to find a way that actually is, is the right uh, as best as possible you talk you talk about a less restrictive or environment and um, sure you want to make some comments on that Mick? well um, look i guess tim yeah i mean again you know um an episode of restraint is a temporary measure and should always be in the least restrictive form and used for the least amount of time necessary. And I guess that's something that we're all we're all trying to achieve. I guess from a legal position or from a legal perspective, you know, in general, the application of restraint on a person without their consent is unlawful. Um, so from a European Convention on Human Rights perspective, the use of restraint can only be justified if it is medical if it is sorry if it justified if it is a medical or therapeutic necessity mm -hmm. so i think we have to remember that and we must remember also that the, the standard of proof required to to establish this is very high so the standard of proof to provide evidence of, of that is very very high but i guess you know if it is you know if it is and, and you know rights versus risk and positive risk taking and, and all of the other concepts um it's about having clear evidence in place to demonstrate that you have trialed and tried every other every other alternative. And um, I guess you know, and I know it came in. I, I saw in one of the, the, the chat questions earlier on, you know, qu queries around what we might call prescribed supports. So, um, and, and I guess one of the findings on our thematic inspections, which we were doing before COVID put a put a stop to our gallop, um, but you know, we did do over a, over a year of of restrictive practice thematic inspections. And what we found in terms of those prescribed supports was that they sometimes weren't subject to the to the to review or robust assessment in the same way uh, as as other restrictive practices, and therefore that their their presence may not be questioned. So you know when I when I when I say prescribed supports, I guess I mean things like you know the use of 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 monitoring alarms or monitoring systems, the use of splints. Um, perhaps the use of bed rails, although bed rails are not all that common in disability services, even though they, they do create a lot of uh, um, um, conversation and a lot of concern in relation to it. Um, so I guess it's about looking at, you know, that they, they may be a less restrictive alternative, but they still need to be assessed and monitored to ensure that, is, that it does not restrict the person in their movement or their behaviour. So I guess, you know, the rationale may be clear, however, it's the consequence of the use of the prescribed item, which which is often the restrictive practice. So, to use the bed to, to use the bed rail example, you know, um, you know, we'll often have this debate over whether it's a restrictive practice or whether it's considered an enabler. Um, and you know, I suppose in in relation to bed rails, our position would be that calling a bed rail an enabler is questionable. But the guidance for inspectors is that this may be a, le a legitimate practice. But it should still be called a restrictive practice and assessed and reviewed as a restrictive practice. I think that's very helpful, Mick, and I think it's very good that you brought 
the need for that rigor um that yeah. they, you know because we, i started the start of this morning by saying our international obligations under uncprd but also in terms of the commencement now of, of assisted decision making and it's it's also the right thing to do to respect people Absolutely. so but also that we need the evidence base and the evidence base also has to be reviewed assessed and monitored so these really important points you've made there around the kind of rigor that we and it's a team that's been there this morning that that rigor and i think ruth touched on it there about governance and oversight and um you know um, David and Regina talking very well on the person at the centre and not jumping to the control solution. Um, something has to be evidence is proportional, necessary, and required. Um, I'm just mindful of time, guys. I, 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 David here. I, sorry, I, I have no camera. For some reason, I switched yeah, it off. You work with there, David. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I have one. Yeah. Are you, I was going to make one comment. Yes. It's just as a team also coming through. Like we're here talking about change, we're talking about safeguarding, we're talking about lifting restrictions. And just one of the things I would say, if like it was raised, like how can staff raise this? What are the working environment that can't raise those situations? That's a real safeguarding issue for us to be aware of because yeah. we should be working in environments where we can voice in the best interest of the person that we're we're we're, we're, we're trying to support. And there are things like rights review committees that have existed in agencies and they're growing there and there should be resources there. So it's just something that struck me as we were having discussions yeah. because safeguarding is where we're coming from here as well. And if I haven't, if I can't raise an issue around a living arrangement for somebody, how can I raise an issue around a safeguarding concern I have? So I think there needs, it needs to be put that from a human rights perspective, if we're serious about this and we're working in this, we're working from that perspective, which means we raise issues that concern us. So I really, really, really important point, David. And I was just going to go around the panel for kind of one one minute comment uh, uh, on both how we raise the voice of, of the person living, but also how we involve the person and maybe somebody who has limited communication or cognitive capacity in, in decision making. And then I'm going to come to um, Gillian to make some final comments. But I'm going to go around the panel about that point. Th th those two kind of teams are about about the the the, the that um, it, you know I need to create an environment where we we have uncomfortable conversations at times and raise concern, but also how do we involve the person centrally and maybe people who have uh, uh, limited communication or or um, communicate through through behaviours. Ruth, I might come to you first in, in one minute to kind of. <laughs> Two meaty issues, but if you had advice for people today, or a message, or a, a take-home message from from our, our our dialogue this morning, I'll, I'll try not I'll try not to be too controversial. But from my from my experience of working in services for the year, for over the years, like inevitably, if if a person is living in the right environment with the right people, um, either with housemates or on their own. Um, and and is matched with the right support, people who understand them, who get them in the right relationship. Inevitably, there's less need for the likes of me to to jump in with with behavioural assessments, and there's definitely a less less of a need for restrictive practices. So so much of this work is about proactively designing the right types of services for people mm -hmm. and enabling our staff to provide the right levels of support. And the most important part of all of that. As, as I think we've all discovered over the last two years of, of the COVID pandemic, is, is the right relationships. Yeah. So when you back to that, that relationship is central, isn't it? Trust and feel safe with, um, inevitably, that, that's what good support looks like. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, 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 Regina, do you, do you have a takeaway message about uh, how do we ensure the person is centre and, and we can, as staff, raise things and, 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 and voice that feel uncomfortable or have reservations about some some practice in my service or centre. How do we do that? Yeah, this is actually a very topical thing, both in, in the classroom with my students and also as David and I present um, safeguarding training um, to all our staff. And what we would say to people is sometimes people get fearful about whether or not their assessment of the restriction is that they're missing something and they, they, they kind of talk themselves into uncertainty. And one of the very simple basic messages I would give to the students and the staff that I support would be 
if it's not okay for someone you love, then it's not okay for somebody else. And if you ask that question, it will always take you home to the right answer. Great. Thank you. That's a wonderful right. message, Regina. Mick, is there, from your perspective, a take home message from our conversations? This yeah, I, yeah, I think there's a couple of things, if I can just briefly get through them. And I think, you yeah. know, R Root, you know, touched on the first one, and that is around the living environment that people are living in. You know, that is, for me, one of the most uh, reasons for having to implement restrictive practices in the first place, the compatibility of residents, um, uh, you know, not being not being properly assessed, and you know, residents and staff then having to, residents having to live in very uncomfortable environments, and staff having to try and work within within those very uncomfortable environments as well. Um, I guess, you know, you know, there's been a lot of over the last couple of years. There's been a lot of talk around capacity and consent, and you know, the enactment of the of, of the decision making legislation, etc. That we're all hoping will 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 move to the fore in, during during this year. And I guess again, what we've seen is is um, we've seen some good examples, I guess, of of you know people of, of providers and staff using consent forms to try and start at least a conversation with residents and their families, um, and um, and using them in meetings with residents and their families, and at least that's creating a healthy discussion on on the why and the when of of restrictive practices. But I guess you know Regina summed it up really well there. You know we often see. Or we, we we would have staff saying that you know Mick has consented to extremely restrictive practices is, is within their life, and you know the, the question is whether they can consent to that, or or or, or whether they would consent to that, you know. Uh, and again, you know, as Regina said, would you want that kind of restriction on your own life? So it's about involving people more in those conversations. Thanks very much. Really important point there. But would you want that yourself? And uh, 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 seeing there's an opportunity as well with, with the ADM implementation that we 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 really bringing forward the and, and the revision of the HC's consent policy. The, the all of the items we we raised today about the person being at the centre and 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 the capable environment creating that environment for people. Um, David, in in a minute, any takeaway message you'd like for our audience before I come to Mario? Yeah. In a takeaway, I understand we all support people, and I understand it's a privilege to be involved, and we have to respect privacy and confidentiality. But I would emphasize, I think we should share the learning, because if somebody's doing something now that could make a change in another person's situation, we need to share the learning, and I think we need to get better at that. Great. Th thanks very much, Dave. And talking about sharing the learning, a couple of people have asked about Peter McGill's um, book. Um, that Ruth had referenced, building a capable environment. We'll put up the reference for that. We will email people out of the slides that Mary has done. And I know people have asked, is it recorded? Yes, it is, and it'll be available. Uh, Mary, I'm gonna, before I come to, to Gillian to, to wrap up with final thoughts, our panelists, um, uh, we could have probably spent all day on this. We could spend yeah. all day talking about positive risk taking, about human rights approaches, language, terminology, you know, good governance, building that capable environment from yourself um thoughts observations from this morning you just think i think first of all and as mick said earlier the fact that so many people registered with this event i think is very positive uh, secondly what uh, regina was saying about this these discussions are being had in the classroom so our new generation of um social care workers are going to this is going to be embedded in them um and i think it's uh, it's that's very positive and i think uh, ruth already mentioned this but one of the real positives that came out of COVID as well was a huge discussion around consent that i, I and the whole preparation around consent and tools that we were able to develop with speech and language therapists and the like experts in the area around um that discussion and how to prepare people for things like desensitization for you know getting the vaccine or for getting testing and all this kind of thing but for the first time and it, it's outside of disability services which i think is really positive i mean there were groups that were you know acute hospitals were asking us for the for the guidance and you know medics were looking for the advice gps were looking for the advice so i think this is hugely important because um I, I think that you know this has widened the discussion out even beyond disability services, which is to be welcomed. So I just thanks to everybody on the panel because you were all terrific. Yeah, no, I, I, I echo that, and I think the work you did right through COVID in very very difficult times and circumstances around the tools to support decision making and consent. I think we need to 
continue that and even with greater rigor into the future. I'm also very heartened to hear from, from Regina about students. I, I cringe back in my days in the, in the 80s and working residential care, the kind of practices and the approaches I had. So I think of today, I'm, I'm delighted that, that the, 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 the word human rights wasn't heard a lot back in my day in, in the 80s. So um, uh, it's, it's great that that's, that's to the fore. Um, so can I say on behalf of, of myself, and that is to thank you very much to the panel. I'm going to come to Gillian in a moment for some final comments. Um, but we certainly, I'd be very interested in coming back to this topic. I think there's huge levels of interest there and maybe focusing on a particular team or a particular area. It might be on the area of, of supporting people in, 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 in their decision or their involvement. In, in, in decision making, it might be on how we support staff to have a voice and raise concerns. It could be on the area of, of imminent risk or, or even positive risk taking. So I certainly would, would be very open to coming back to this. Gillian, are you there? From, I from am the indeed. Tim. Thank you that, very uh, much. Gillian, would you like to make some some comments on, on, on behalf of the federation um, on this well, morning? Really just... I bet we could have gone on all day, Gillian. Absolutely, Tim, and it's lovely just to see the wealth of comments and questions, queries coming in on the chat box. And just as you've said, we'll be recording all the event this morning and sharing that and reflecting on the comments coming in, Tim, with a view to potentially looking at having a follow on session, because I think this is the start of a conversation, really. So again, just to say thank you so much to yourself, Tim, and the team in the office, to Colleen, who's been doing all the background work on the IT side there. Thank you so much and to Bridget, who's here in the office with me, just looking or keeping an eye to the questions and comments. In particular, thank you to Mari for taking us through the guiding principles document. And that has been so informative in terms of looking at this whole area from a human rights perspective. And really, if we take that approach, we can't go far wrong. So I think it's been a really informative conversation this morning. And thank you so much to the panelists for sharing their experience and insights. Um, in this area. So I suppose there have been a number of kind of issues brought up. I think that even from the comments coming through on the text box, the whole area of supporting staff and ongoing education and learning in this area, the sharing of kind of experiences and the providing opportunities for reflective practice for staff. They're all such important areas so that staff don't feel alone in this area and that there is an openness to talking about the issues, the cases, the challenges that are coming up um, for people in their day to day work, but ensuring really Really at the centre of the, this whole conversation are the individuals that we're supporting and that the rights and voice of people are listened to and acknowledged and that we keep our focus on positive risk taking and enabling individuals um, from a human rights perspective. So thank you very much to everyone um, to the 600 plus people who took part in the webinar this morning. I hope you found it informative. We will share the recording after the event so that you can share it with colleagues. And indeed, if you have any further comments, questions, please don't hesitate them to send them through to either the National Safeguarding Office or to ourselves here in the Federation. Thank you, Tim. Bye now, and thank you all. Thanks once again to Mary, to Mick, David, Regina, to Ruth, Colleen, and, 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 and Bridget there. And we will return to this really important topic. Um, it, it is an area, I think, we, we work with professional bodies, representative associations, certainly in our work with the um, National Federation of Voluntary uh, Bodies and their Child and Adult Safeguarding Committee. I think there, it is a really important, delighted, that an audience over 600 people, it's the largest audience we ever had, Jenny. In the, I don't know about in the Federation, but we normally, if we get 100 people for a, a webinar, we're, we're thrilled. So, um, uh, particularly to Mary for preparing the, um, the, the slides and for people's contribution to the discussions. Uh, we've learned a lot from this morning. I've, I've learned a lot as well, taking a note, copious notes. So, goodbye, and, and it won't be the last we hear this. It's, it's a journey, not a destination. So, thank you all. and. Have a nice day for the rest of the day. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye now. Bye bye. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.